Riddle me this. What is something that we make and send out into the world without ever leaving our apartment? This podcast? Indeed! <gasps> I'm Claire! And I'm Vince. And this is... Friends, Friends of Legend! Legend. Legend, a podcast where your old pals Vince and Claire discuss the mystery and delights of the magical creatures that this world shares with us. Wonder! <laughs> That's very cute. <laughs> this episode is the big one oh, We've made it. Made it all the way. <laughs> you know, it, it's Ain't much no more of a... stopping us now. It's much more of a triumph when you consider the time that goes into making it. But <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. You slave over that uh, audio software. I sure do. Today, we are going to talk about the most ancient creature that I know of, the Sphinx. That's pretty ancient. So I know that one of the big questions that you had, Vince, is what is the plural of Sphinx? Because you so love to say Sphinges. I sure do. Like the plural of phalanx is phalanges, I always assume that the plural of Sphinx is Sphinges. Well, you're in luck. I found out that the plural is either Sphinxes or Sphinges. Sphinges! So I'll be saying Sphinxes because it just sounds less pretentious, but... <laughs> well... You know that you are never going to stop me from saying sphinges. That's fine. The word sphinx comes from the Greek word meaning to squeeze or to tighten up, and I wasn't about to try to pronounce the Greek word. Huh. But the reason for the creature being named that word is most likely because it's referring to the lioness, which is the hunter of a pride of lions, the way she strangles her prey. She squeezes, she tightens up. And, of course, if you were not aware, a sphinx is typically a sort of amalgamation of a few different animals. But most of the time, one big component of the creature is a lion. You know what we should call chimeras like that? What? Disorganisms. Ah. <laughs> so, with that little aside out of the way, do sphinxes, sphinges hunt and, like, kill like lionesses? They don't always move around a whole lot. They're not super mobile, but I will go into their eating habits a little later. First, I want to get into more of the appearance of the Sphinx. Yes, please. You've got Sphinxes that have kind of evolved in whatever region of the world they live in. So there's a bit of variety in the look of the Sphinx. In general, a Sphinx will most likely have the head of a human, or a falcon, or a sheep, or a cat. That's fun. Meow. And the body of a lion with the wings of an eagle. That is one of the more common looks of the Sphinx. There are many different regions of the world that are home to Sphinxes. We're going to mostly talk about the Greek and Egyptian Sphinxes today. That makes sense to but, me. But, yeah. So Greek Sphinxes are a little bit different in that they have the head of a woman, the haunches of a lion, and the wings of a bird. But then they have their tail ending in the head of a snake. Oh, yeah, I think I've seen pictures of that. Yeah, they're very prevalent in ancient art and architecture. So you probably have seen that, at least when studying relics. And then the Egyptian Sphinx has more of a masculine look to it. They have the head of a man, and they're often adorning a pharaoh headdress. Okay, that actually... I think is sort of represented in Dungeons and Dragons. There are two Sphinxes, Sphinges, <laughs> in Dungeons and Dragons, at least fifth edition. There's the Andro Sphinx, which of course Andro means male. It's a, a male sort of lion figure with a pharaoh headdress. And then there's the Gyno Sphinx, of course Gyno is female, more lioness like and gentler features. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So those are the, the Greek and the Egyptian Sphinxes. Then you also have sphinxes that roam around South and Southeast Asia. Really? 
Yes, those were more evolved to have the head of a lion and the body of a human. Oh, that's that's fun. That's pretty backwards and lovely. It is. And those, please forgive me for my pronunciation, but the Sanskrit word is purushamriga, hmm. which means man-beast. Man-beast. And specifically, those like to live in South India. And I'll talk about their disposition a little later. But there are also sphinxes in France, which is more of a feminine creature, the head and torso of a young woman. Okay. And the body of a lion. So I guess it's really not a huge variety, but more or less you're going to have some kitty cat parts, some human parts, and they're more or less going to be the size of a typical lion. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's not, not as grand as what you typically picture a sphinx as, but still large. Yeah, yeah. While we're on the topic of where sphinxes live in the world, there were sphinxes sighted in ancient Mesopotamia. Yeah, I've definitely seen pictures of, like, winged lions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's exactly the same thing. It could very well be, if not a hybrid with another magical creature. And then there are Burmese sphinxes called Manuthiha. Please also forgive me for that. And then you had Pliny the Elder who once said that Ethiopia produces many sphinxes. So they mostly like to run around in the eastern half of the world. Pliny certainly had a lot to say about everything. <laughs> but as I said before, we are going to focus mostly on the Egyptian and the Greek sphinxes. Sphinxes. <laughs> Thank you, fiancé. <laughs> fiancé. It is most widely held that sphinxes came from Egypt. And they were not necessarily given a, a name that stuck until the Greeks found out about the Sphinx. And that is why you have the Greek word Sphinx. That makes sense to me. I wonder what they called them then. Like, hey, look at that lion eagle person. Possibly. And of course, you only have the Mediterranean Sea separating Egypt and Greece. So there was a lot of commerce and communication between the two countries back in the day and today. So what I'm thinking is possibly the first sphinxes either jumped on a boat or swam across the Mediterranean Sea to get up to Greece. Or flip-flapped their way over if they got the eagle wings. Right, yeah, if they were lucky enough to be blessed with the wings. However, the disposition of the sphinxes that came from Egypt and the sphinxes that were, I want to say, the descendants of the Egyptian sphinxes that lived mostly in Greece are very, very different. The Egyptian sphinx is thought of as more of a benevolent creature, but with some serious strength still. They are mostly lion, so they've got a ferocity about them. While the Greek sphinx is a bit of a treacherous and malevolent being, who is known to severely punish those that she deems unworthy. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't heard of malevolent sphinges before. I'd like to learn more about that. Oh, yes. So both the Greek and the Egyptian sphinx are thought of as guardians. They will predominantly guard the entrances of temples and other holy sites. But while the Egyptian sphinx is mm, maybe more placid, I might say, the Greek sphinx will ask passers-by a riddle. And this is probably something that many of our listeners are familiar with, the riddle of the Sphinx. If you get the riddle wrong, then the Greek Sphinx will eat you. Bummer, man. Yeah, so I know that you were curious about their diet. Yes. That's all I know about the diet. People. That <laughs> bad riddlers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and really, the only chance that you have to prove your worthiness to this female Sphinx is whether or not you can get this riddle right. Which kind of stinks. So is it always the same riddle? Because I think we all know the the one most commonly attributed riddle to Sphinges. Right. So there's the main one, which there are many ways of saying it, but more or less it goes like this. What creature has one voice and yet becomes four-footed and two-footed and three-footed? And the answer to that is... A uh, man. Man. Because you crawl on all fours as a baby... And later in life, you walk on all twos. <laughs> all twos. <laughs> and then when you're elderly, you get your walking stick and that's your third leg. You walk on all threes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> More rarely, she would ask another riddle. There are two sisters 
One gives birth to the other, and she, in turn, gives birth to the first. Do you know that one? I have never heard that one. The answer is day and night, probably because... I figured. This sphinx was Greek, she spoke in Greek, so the words for day and night in Greek are feminine words, so they're sisters. Blam! There Blam. you go. You know, if I were a hungry sphinx, I'd want to come up with a riddle that maybe didn't have anything directly to do with my prey so that I'd have a better chance of filling my tum. But that's just me. Yeah, well, see, that riddle is so commonplace today, but there were quite a few poor folks that could not figure that one out. Maybe the answer, the correct answer, just wasn't passed around to the unfortunate few. So that kind of sums up what the sphinxes are known for in Egypt and Greece, what they, what they do, their purpose in life. But let me tell you a little bit more about the legend. Long ago, in ancient Greece, several of the Greek gods were angry with the city of Thebes for some ancient crime. It's unspecified. And they spent... They spent? <laughs> Please keep that in. <laughs> and, and they sent the Sphinx from her home on the Nile to Thebes to punish the city. She was supposed to kind of act as a plague on the people. But instead of ravaging the city streets, she decided to perch atop Mount Fikion and asked all the passers-by the riddle that we had aforementioned. The riddle of the Sphinx. Of course, being a malicious lady, she would kill and eat all of the citizens that got the riddle wrong. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Creon, the king of Thebes at the time, became so desperate after the Sphinx ate his very son. So he offered up his kingdom and his daughter to anyone that could solve the riddle. Oedipus answered the call and solved the riddle with his answer, man. And the Sphinx was distraught. She had been finally bested. So she threw herself from the highest rock to her own death. Man. It, it's a very tragic story for everyone involved. But this Sphinx, all she knew was chaos. She had created drought and famine. And she would only leave the people alone if they got her riddle right, and no one did until Oedipus did, so... I was going to say, you'd think that she'd just scamper off to the next town and, you know, beset the other villagers with that riddle that no one else could solve, apparently. Right. But... Yeah, I, I think it was more that the gods had sent her there on a mission, and she wasn't going to leave until she had fulfilled her duty? And it sounded like she certainly did. She she wreaked havoc on the city, but yeah, it was kind of strange that she um more or less gave up after her riddle was solved. That is wicked sad. Yeah. Gosh, I, I feel kind of terrible that we are often telling stories about our friends of legend meeting tragic ends. Yeah. But that is that is part of the way that we come to appreciate them and everything that they do for us. Um, her specifically, she didn't do a lot of good, but there are some that are quite a bit kinder. And believe it or not, as far as we know, there is only the one official Greek Sphinx. Hmm. Now, that could be that the others are, are just so reclusive, but they, they do seem to be a lot more prevalent in their homeland of Egypt. It is pretty common knowledge that the Sphinx is one of the emblems of the great country of Egypt. Most of the time when someone talks about a sphinx, you picture the Great Sphinx of Giza. Yep, that's the only one I know. And the Great Sphinx of Giza sits on the Giza Plateau on the bank of the Nile, and many people believe it has the face of Pharaoh Khafra. Man, I want to come back as a, a sphinx with my face and just chill in front of a pyramid. Yeah, I mean, it does seem extremely relaxing. But the Great Sphinx of Giza guards the tombs of the pharaohs. He guards the pyramids of Giza. The purpose of the Great Sphinx's construction is still up for debate, but modern Egyptologists believe that it has been there since around 2500 BC. He old! Mm-hmm. But we don't know for sure since it doesn't have any inscriptions upon it. And though this Great Sphinx is made of limestone at least on the outside, I 
speculate that it might just be a very ancient hibernating real-life sphinx. No one can tell us exactly when it was created, if at all, because maybe he was just born well before any of us were. I know I get really crusty when I uh, when I sit still for too long. <laughs> Another thing, so you keep calling it the Great Sphinx of Giza. This implies that there is a good, okay, and bad Sphinx of Giza. <laughs> is this true? <laughs> no comment. Oh. <laughs> So those are the stories of the the main sphinxes of Greece and Egypt. There was also a sphinx that lived in Burma, like I said, or still does. And legend says that he was created by Buddhist monks to protect a newborn royal baby from being eaten by ogresses. Ogresses? Specifically female ogres? Specifically. So that is one example of another good, kind sphinx. What are you doing in my swamp, sphinx? <laughs> There are also stories of sphinxes that guard temples that bestow blessings on worshippers of those temples to make the people pure of heart and to wash away their sins. That's really special. Yeah, sphinxes are definitely some wise beasties. It is said that their gaze can see into the very souls of men. So they seem to really have the gift of insight into the nature and disposition of humans. Yeah, they definitely exhibit that profound wisdom while also at the same time not really giving away any of their own intentions. I know in, in Dungeons and Dragons, to go back to that, each, uh, both the Andrew Sphinx and the Gyno Sphinx have an ability called Inscrutable, which means that they are immune to essentially insight or any kind of magic that reveals their intentions to you. And that is based in reality. While Sphinxes are so, so dang wise, they try to share their wisdom with humans on occasion through prophecies, but they're usually spoken in such ancient and abstract languages that the humans just don't understand what they're trying to say at all, which is very unfortunate because uh -huh. they have so much knowledge up there, I'm imagining, but we'll never know for sure. That would almost be Lovecraftian if it were also existentially terrifying. Right. So just to cap off the powers of the Sphinx, a cult legend describes the four powers of the Sphinx, which are to know, to will, to dare, and to keep silent. And humans are encouraged to, to work on developing these powers so that they can reach the ideal state of wisdom and master the four elements avatar style, water, air, fire, and earth. Hooray! So I don't know any specific stories about humans that have gotten to that point. But I'd love to find out. I imagine they turn into sphinxes. Could very well be. Ah, that resonates with me. Aw. So that kind of wraps up the appearance, the disposition, and the behaviors of the majestic sphinx. Now I want to talk a little bit about how their legacy lives on through pop culture today. Yes, please. Maybe not pop culture today, necessarily, but at least in the past couple hundred years. Sphinxes have been an icon featured in Masonic architecture. Hmm. And Edgar Allan Poe also wrote a short story called The Sphinx, which I can't wait to read. And of course, in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, there was a Greek Sphinx that was stationed in the third task in the maze of the Triwizard Tournament. And she had the following riddle to ask the champions. And if you want, you can play along at home and... <laughs> And try to figure it out if you don't remember. First, think of the person who lives in disguise, who deals in secrets and tells naught but lies. Next, tell me what's always the last thing to mend, the middle of middle and the end of the end. And finally, give me the sound often heard during the search for a hard-to-find word. Now string them together and answer me this. Which creature would you be unwilling to kiss? I remember this one. I don't like spiders. <laughs> yes, the answer is spider, and I do not think I would be able to solve that one, especially under the pressure of the demon maze. But luckily, our hero, Harry Potter, did figure that one out, so he was not et. Et. I don't remember. Did the Goblet of Fire Sphinx have a snake tail? I don't think it was mentioned that she had a snake tail, but it was definitely a woman. Hmm. So therefore, she was a Greek Sphinx. That is also canon, by the way. I didn't just come up with that. 
And then, of course, you have the Sphinx cat, which is the probably most well-known breed of hairless cat. And they are not from Egypt, but they were indeed named after the Great Sphinx of Giza. That makes sense, even though Sphinges are typically not represented as hairless. Right. I'm not sure exactly why that was the breed that was named after the Sphinx, but we must remember that the ancient Egyptians worshipped cats, so it was about time that one of the breeds was named after the, the magical creature, and the Sphinx breed was not actually recognized until semi-recent history, but that's beside the point. And then lastly, I am obligated to remind everyone that there is a Pokemon from the fourth generation called Shinx, and it's a little lion cub baby. The whole line is supposed to be uh, Sphinx-related, like you have Luxio and Luxray, who, of course, are named after the Egyptian city of Luxor. Didn't know that. That's really neat. But that is all I have on the Majestic Sphinx. Now, this is the part of the show where we give our friend a rating based on how easy it is to become friends with them. And I think today we're going to abbreviate it because we've had 10 episodes at this point. We've got the four tiers of our rating system. The first one is friend-shaped. That is going to be the easiest friend to get along with. Next up is cheeky friend. They're going to get up into some mischief and goofage. Third, we have spicy friend. It's a little harder to become friends with them. They're a little bit dangerous at times, but we can still pal up. And lastly is not a friend yet. No real record of friendship, and usually run-ins are not good for people. So I would rate different types of sphinxes different things. The Greek sphinx, that has very little patience with people who don't get her riddles solved, I would deem not a friend yet. Yeah, not a friend yet. I don't think you can even have a good conversation with her without her getting PO'd. And, you know, best case scenario... You're going to solve her riddle and she's going to jump off a cliff. And where does that leave you? I know. It's it's just bad all around. But the South Indian and the Egyptian sphinxes, I would say friend-shaped. Friend-shaped? I'd say spicy friend, because don't they get rari when you don't answer their riddles right? So as far as I know, and listeners, please correct me if I'm wrong, but the only record I have of... Of the riddling sphinxes are the Greek ones. The Egyptian sphinxes and and those from other regions of the world are there to guard temples, but I'm not sure exactly what they do if you answer the the riddles wrong, if, if they are riddling at all. They are, besides being quite wise, big strong creatures, after all. So it is quite possible that just their their sheer size and and muscle is intimidating enough to keep anyone who has ill will toward the temples and places that they're guarding away. But yeah, I I didn't find any information about the non-Greek sphinxes telling riddles. Hmm. Well, I guess then yeah, friend-shaped it is. Not to mention the fact that many of them are washing away the sins of worshippers when they go into temples, which I think is pretty dang useful. Yeah, I guess I guess that's pretty friend-shaped behavior. Well, thank you so very much for listening to us talk about the Sphinx. Or Sphinges. Yes, he will never let me forget that. Never, ever. Just remember, y'all, if you liked what you heard today, then please feel free to subscribe to us wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you want to drop us a rating, that would be lovely as well. We'd super appreciate it. Also, if you're wanting to catch up on the whole host of shows, learn more about the show itself, even send us a recommendation for what creature you'd like to hear next, you can go to friendsoflegend.com. Right, and we post new episodes every Saturday, so stay tuned, and don't forget to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, or just stay up to date on our website. Thank you so much again for listening, and remember, when it comes to Friends of Legend, charm them. Do not harm them.
you made it to the end. You're the best.